Welcome. Thanks for joining today, no matter what time zone you're in. Uh, thanks for being on Central Time. So we've got Alex and Lucinda are calling um, from over the pond. And Jordan's here in Chicago with me. And we're excited because I know most of you are either not ship bomb merchants or maybe you are ship bomb merchants and you're interested in learning how can I grow, grow ex and expand globally um, my e-commerce brand by expanding into the EU and UK, which is what we're focusing on today in our session, because it can be scary. It can be daunting. There's a lot of things that you have to do before you can go live um, to be uh, VAT compliant and make sure that you're uh, aligning with all those obligations and regulations. Um, so we're going to do a high level overview, dive in some details about um, what to expect when expanding to the EU and UK. Alex is going to talk about that. Lucinda is going to talk about recent changes with Brexit and other things to expect, changes that came this year. Jordan is our specialist um, for global expansions at ShipBob. Um, so yeah, we have Alex from Simply That, Lucinda from the International um, Trade Consultancy, and Jordan from ShipBob. Let me share my screen with everybody. Also, you guys, do you guys want to give any intros for yourself? Alex, Jordan, or Lucinda, no? Okay. Okay. I think everyone can share, can see my screen. So yeah, going global in the EU and UK, going cross-border. This is going to be a series because if you don't know, ShipBob has facilities in the EU, UK, Canada, and Australia. So this is just the first of a couple different sessions just to educate you guys on what it takes um, what to expect when expanding to new regions. Okay. Yep. So our panelists, like I said, Jordan Russell is the manager of global expansion, global sales and expansion at ShipBob. Alex is global projects manager at SimplyVat, and Lucinda is the founder at the International Trade Consultancy. So what we'll talk about today, um, we'll go over why you should consider glo expanding globally, fulfilling international orders and how that works. Um, what is VAT and how does that work? Upcoming compliance changes to the EU and UK, expanding into new EU territories, and then how to get in touch um, with the team here if you have any further questions. So I'll kick it off to Jordan um, to talk about why going global and a little bit over um, how ShipUp can help you guys go global. Awesome. Thanks, Fran. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining us from the world today. Um, I think that's kind of key of why to go global, because a lot of you today are not just joining here from the United States. I see in the chat, Bob's from Perth, Scotland. So we're talking about people all over the world. So it's important that when we think about our business, we want to go global. And why is that? Well, we've got some statistics here for you. 70% of customers make international purchases. 62% of merchants have cross-border operations. And really, when you open up your business to the world, you're actually increasing your average order value as well for those international orders by 17%. So it's huge when you can sell yourself internationally and be in those global markets. And then also we're seeing huge growth potential when you start expanding your business um, elsewhere in the world. Here at ShipBob for the past year, we've been helping merchants expand to our global FCs. Um, today we're gonna talk about UK and EU, and it's so impactful because what we've seen from our merchants today is when we take them to a new region of the world, their sales start to incrementally increase and get bigger and bigger. And these markets start to become huge for them where they before they never thought about going to them. Uh, next slide. All right, so we're gonna kind of talk about these cross-border without the complexities. So what you kind of need is this, this global network, the connected technology, and then local tax and tariff compliance. So that third part we'll leave to the experts of Alex and then Lucinda to kind of talk about and I'm gonna tackle these first two pieces for y'all. All right, so with ShipBob, we have a global logistics platform for all of our fulfillment for D2C brands. Um, we have 25 and growing fulfillment centers around the world. Um, today we're talking about UK and EU, so it's very impactful. EU, we have Poland coming very soon, starting next week. Um, so really hitting that mainland Europe from our Poland facility. And from these regions, we're able to do the custom packaging, the gift notes, the inserts. Um, we have the carbon neutral fulfillment um, from the U.S. perspective, because even if when we talk about this, global does include U.S. Because once again, I'm going to call out Bob from the chat. He's in Scotland. So for him, the United States is a global facility. Um, we have 100 percent coverage there for two day delivery across the U.S. And then our partnerships. So Fran and Gina, who kind of put this on, Fran's part of our partnerships team, and she's always looking for direct integrations for partners around the globe to help make our merchants more successful. 
Um, currently, we have warehouses, obviously, in the United States, Canada, EU, Great Britain, UK, and Australia. Um, so why is it important to have like these global facilities? So in the United States, if you're a U.S. business and if you're a U.S. merchant, we talk about distributed inventory. We talk about like, hey, we have a facility on the East Coast and West Coast. Instead of just being on the East Coast and fulfilling all the way across the country to the West Coast, we say to you, hey, have you thought about splitting your inventory to our East Coast facility and West Coast facility? What does that do? That helps you with time and transit and it helps you with cost. So when we look at this on a global scale, we're thinking the same exact thing. If I have 500 orders a month that go to the UK and I'm paying a certain amount, doesn't it make sense that I wanna go and open a global facility in the UK to A, have a better time in transit and a more economical cost? Um, so here, this next slide, we're gonna kind of dig into it of what I just talked about. So when we look at this, we're gonna take an average. So just so you all know, this is average pricing. This is just average time in transit. This is not necessarily a specific persons. This is just average stuff that we're looking at here. So when I look at today from the US to the UK for a one pound package, I'm looking at an $18.30 charge from a transportation fulfillment. I'm looking at almost seven days time in transit being from the US to the UK. So it's a much different experience today if you're shipping from the US to the UK for your merchants there, your customers there in the United Kingdom. Now let's say I'm gonna open my global facility with inside the United Kingdom. So at this point, we see our UK to UK cost from fulfillment and transportation drop all the way to $8.91. And then what does our time in transit do? It also drops to almost two days. So a much faster time in transit, a much more economical cost. And as you can kind of see here, when we look at being in a global facility, we're really looking at cost reduction from our fulfillment, so in this example, we took 25 packages a month to the United Kingdom, did our little calculations, our math. Um, hopefully I did it right, y'all, so you can check my math after this, but we double checked it a couple times. But when we look at it, we see a 51% reduction in fulfillment and transportation costs by being inside the United Kingdom. And then the huge time saver here is that time in transit. You're able to get these packages to your customers at a much faster 72% reduction time in transit, um, and just as a heads up, our UK, this is from last year, our UK time in transit is always getting better and better and hitting closer to that one day mark. So when we look at this, we're reduced time in transit will always get better as we continue to grow globally here at ShipBop. Awesome. So the next kind of part of this is we also at ShipBop, it's, we're also a tech company. So when we look at this, we have our warehouse management software. And what this does is we have this one platform for you to manage any of your global sites around the world. Um, when I talk to merchants today, this is one of those huge selling points of, I don't have to have a fulfillment partner in Australia and a different one in the United States, or I don't have to have a different fulfillment partner in the UK as well. They come to us and we kind of talk to them about, hey, you can do everything here at ShipHub, one platform, everything's managed from a single dashboard, and you're able to do all of these things here on this list that you're able to do with ShipHub. So it's a huge benefit of having that one partner that can help you anywhere in the globe. Um, on the next slide here, we have a quote from one of our customers. Um, I've always wanted a truly global fulfillment partner. I had been trying to find the solution for years and ShipHub had multiple fulfillment centers in the US, one in Canada, one in the EU, and one in the UK. And all locations filter back into one centralized warehouse management system. So that was from Wes Brown on head of operations at Black Claw. And he is one of our merchants that's been in all, all of our global facilities because for him, we were truly that global fulfillment partner. So I kind of pumped you up. You got you all excited. You're like, yes, I'm ready to go to anywhere in the world with you guys, which is great. So today we're going to talk about the UK and the EU. And next steps we're going to do is I'm going to pass it over to Alex, who's going to kind of talk you through what is necessary to be in those actual facilities in the UK and EU. Thanks so much, Jordan. You really hyped us up. I was really getting going there. Um, so I am uh, Alex Wyatt. I'm from simplyvat.com. Um, we specialize in international VAT compliance for uh, e-commerce sellers, specifically selling on uh, their own websites, on marketplaces all across the EU, UK, Canada, um, and we can help you uh, with your compliance. 
So let's go into the next slide and we're going to cover off a few of the changes, starting with the UK. Um, so first of all, Okay, we have kind of two types of way that you can you can sell into the UK. Um, first off, one was covered by Jordan um, in his first case scenario, sending from the US all the way into the UK where your customers are located. Um, so after Brexit that happened just over a year ago now um, that it actually came to fruition, uh, we completely abolished what was called the low value consignment relief threshold in the UK. And this low value consignment relief threshold meant that you can get items in um, under that were less than 15 pounds. You could get them in completely free of VAT and duties. They got rid of that to make sure that the uh, there was an equal playing field and that taxes were getting uh, paid when any goods were coming into the EU. So now there is a different um, a threshold that's available to sellers and the key number going into the UK is 135 pounds. So um, if you just click next as well, I think the rest of the wording might come up. Thank you. So um, we have two, th two types of consignments. OK, so when we are looking at the consignment values of less than 135 pounds, so any of your items that you're packing and shipping together that are going into the UK directly to a customer less than 135 pounds, you're going to need to have a VAT registration in the UK if you're selling through your own website. What this VAT registration is going to do is it means you're going to charge VAT to your customers at the point of sale. Once you've collected the VAT at the point of sale, you're going to attach a uh, commercial invoice on these uh, goods going into the EU, or sorry, into the UK. And Lucinda's going to talk about all the documentation um, that you need in order to clear your goods through um, customs in the UK. But then your customers are going to essentially receive the parcel without having any extra taxes due as the goods clear through customs. You as the seller who are back registered, you're going to take all that VAT that you've collected and pay that over to HMRC, the local tax authority here in the UK on a quarterly basis. And then um, you continue on trading as normal. If you're selling on a marketplace, the marketplace is going to be responsible to collect the VAT for these types of goods um, that are less than 135 pounds in value. So for any marketplace sales, then they can go through without you having to get VAT registered. When we look at the consignments above 135 pounds, we, re we revert to those normal customs procedures. And when I say normal customs procedures, it means that import VAT and duties are all going to be due at the point of importation. Um, so that means you're going to have to have all your customs documents as well as paying the VAT and duties to uh, the customs authorities before your goods are released to the final customer. So this is where Jordan was talking about maybe these goods start um, taking longer and longer to get to your customer because it depends who you're making the importer of record. So if you as the seller are the importer of record and you are going to become liable to pay these taxes um, as the goods cross through customs and you can reclaim them by being VAT registered. If you make the customer the importer of record, now the customs authority has to go to the customer, ask them to pay the VAT in order for the goods to be released through customs. So you're adding on extra days um, that it's going to take to release those customs and get those goods uh, uh, cleared through customs. So that brings me to the next slide, um, which would be fulfilling your goods actually from the UK. And so the changes that happened after Brexit here, what does this mean to you if you are using maybe ShipBob's warehouse in the UK? So by holding your goods in the UK, it triggers a UK VAT obligation. So be, uh, when you come over and you're speaking to Jordan and you're getting revved up to sell in the UK, now you want to make sure you get your UK VAT registration in place before you send your goods into the UK Fulfillment Centre. This is really important because you can reclaim any of your import VAT that you pay as the goods uh, go into the UK. You can reclaim all of that on your local VAT return um, as a VAT registered business. So it's really important to get that VAT registration in place. You'll also want what's called an EORI number, and it stands for Economic Operator Registration and Identification Number. And this EORI number is linked to your UK VAT number. 
and it goes on your import documents in order to help you um, identify your uh, imports as yours and help you reclaim the import VAT on your local VAT return. So that EORI and the UK VAT registration are really important. You need both of those numbers. If you are selling on a marketplace, the marketplace is actually liable to collect VAT on behalf of non-UK based businesses. So the marketplace is going to be collecting VAT for each and every transaction. However, you as the seller still have to report all of those sales as zero rated sales to the marketplace. So you need to make sure you're calculating these sales and recording them on the local VAT return. If you're selling on your own website directly to UK customers, you are responsible to make sure you're adding in the local rate of VAT here in the UK, which is 20% at standard rate, and you're going to be adding that in to the prices that you list on your own website. Next slide, please. So now looking at the EU, so um, next week, as Jordan said, that ShipBoff is opening up the Polish Fulfillment Center. So this is really exciting. And we've seen a lot of, um, of sales happen in the EU space, especially um, in Germany, which is actually one of the largest markets within the EU. And it's really great because um, when you're fulfilling from Poland, you can actually get your goods into Germany very quickly. And it is typically a cheaper cost than fulfilling from uh, somewhere like Germany, for example. Um, the difference here, so we're going to go into a few of the different rules here that have come into play um, from the EU Commission. Um, so the first one is actually the low value consignment relief threshold um, that I mentioned that from the UK, it's actually been abolished um, going into the EU as well. So it was set at 22 euros. You could have sent goods directly from the US or the UK directly to customers in the EU um, without having to pay any VAT. However, they have completely removed this um, in the name of a level playing field for EU and non-EU businesses alike. So what does this mean for your business as you start importing goods directly to customers in the EU? It means that you have to be charging the local rate of VAT um, to all of your customers in the EU. The VAT rates in the EU range from 17% to 27%. So you need to make sure that your ERP system has the correct um, VAT rates and can identify where your um, customers are located and charge the correct rate on uh, your invoices. Next slide, please. So then there's these new schemes that if you are actually fulfilling from the EU, um, what you can use. So the three new schemes that have come into play only as of July 2021 are the union one-stop shop, the non-union one-stop shop, and the import one-stop shop. The union one-stop shop is going to be really useful, especially if you're fulfilling from a uh, from, from within the EU, such as from the Polish ShipBob warehouse. Um, so this is going to be used for any transactions of physical goods going cross-border to private individuals. So if you're holding your goods in Poland and you're selling to Polish customers, that's going to go on the local Polish return. But the union off scheme is going to be used for all of your Polish um, sales going to customers in Germany or France or Italy, etc. The non-union off scheme is for anybody that's selling digital downloads or digital services. The non-union off scheme is going to be used by you if you're a non-EU business. And the import one-stop shop scheme is going to be used by businesses that are importing goods directly to private customers. So maybe if you're using ShipUp's UK warehouse, for example, um, and you're sending goods directly to private individuals um, in uh, Netherlands, for example, you'll be able to use the import one-stop shop scheme. Next slide, please. So we're going to go into each of these schemes and, and which ones actually would benefit you and how they work in, in practice. Um, so the union off scheme, as I mentioned, is going to be really, really beneficial. It's a completely optional scheme. Um, for businesses to use. Um, and when I say optional, the alternative to a the union off scheme is instead of just having this one quarterly VAT return due where you um, 
uh, declare all of your cross-border transactions, uh, you would actually have to VAT register in each and every EU member state where you have customers. So that could mean up to 27 different VAT registrations, which is just quite impractical for businesses these days, especially if you're on your own trying to manage um, all of your inventory and sales across multiple channels. So what the union OS scheme does essentially is you are going to have one union OS registration in the country where you're holding your inventory. You are going to charge the local rate of VAT based on where your end customers are located and where they're buying from. All of that VAT you, you are going to collect and set aside for a quarterly um, VAT return. You're going to pay the VAT that you've collected to the one member state where you are union OS registered. And that one member state's tax authority is then responsible to take all, all the VAT and look at your report that you filed and split up the VAT amongst themselves so that you only have to manage one VAT return, one payment, um, which really simplifies um, the VAT return process. Um, as a seller, you must keep your records for 10 years. So um, when we talk about records, these are any import records, these are any transactional records, um, whether that's sales or refunds, just in case of an audit, as each and every member state is able to audit your business, um, and they'll all have different timelines available um, that they will uh, actually audit you per up to. Next slide, please. The import one-stop shop scheme is a really, really useful one for um, businesses that are selling goods directly to private customers um, in the EU with a consignment value less than 150 euros. So um, this is, again, a completely optional scheme, but it really simplifies the VAT reporting to the tax authorities, gets your goods to the um, customer quicker without any hassle going through customs. Um, and it's going to be um, a lot easier for you to just report this on a monthly basis as a, as a seller. So how it works in practice um, is you're going to charge VAT at checkout to your the EU customers um, for all of these consignments that are less than 150 euros. You are going to use your IOS number that you get um, when registering, and you're going to put these on all of your customs documents when um, importing your goods into the EU. When the goods are clearing through customs, the customs um, agents will uh, notify your IOS number and allow the customs to uh, allow the parcel to clear through customs without any import VAT or duties as the goods clear through customs. Meaning that these um, there's a fast release of these parcels, and it means your um, goods go straight to the customers a lot quicker than um, the customer having to pay the VAT as the goods um, clear through. What happens with the VAT that you've collected at the point of sale is you're going to hold all of this and on a monthly basis you're going to file the IOS return to the member state that you have registered and again the met that um, member state is going to take all the VAT and split the VAT amongst the other member states where you've collected the VAT from. So it's a really big simplification um, to having to VAT register in each and every country to take on that responsibility for your customers or to make your customer the um, person liable to pay the import VAT and duties as the goods clear through customs. Um, so it's something to consider depending on where you're fulfilling your goods from, whether they're coming from the UK or the US, for example, and going into uh, the EU. Next slide, please. I just wanted to touch quickly on marketplaces. So if you are a seller that's coming over into the EU, this is going to be a really um, prevalent slide for you and really important slide. The first two points are the types of transactions that marketplaces are actually going to um, take on the responsibility of collecting and remitting the VAT on your behalf. So it's going to be any B2C sales of goods imported into the EU with a consignment value of less than 150 euros. So essentially the marketplaces have their own import one-stop shop scheme ID and um, you will, as a seller, can use it if you're selling on their marketplace. 
And then the second type of transaction where marketplaces are responsible to collect the VAT are the B2C supplies of goods within the EU by a non-EU seller. And this is irrespective of the value of the goods. So if you're fulfilling all of your goods from ShipBob's Polish warehouse, for example, you'll be able to um, just have your Polish VAT registration and the uh, marketplace is going to take care of the rest of the VAT compliance for you. You just need to uh, file your local Polish uh, VAT return. Next slide, please. Yeah, Alex, would this come into play if someone's selling on Amazon? Absolutely. And like we're fulfilling so their orders? Absolutely. So when I talk about marketplaces, I mean, Amazon, eBay, we're looking at C discount, Frugo, all of those types of marketplaces um, where you're actually logging onto their URL to, to actually um, buy their buy your goods. Um, those marketplaces are going to be responsible for collecting the VAT on your behalf. Um, if you're selling on your own website, then you are going to have that responsibility to collect the VAT. So those are kind of the two pathways um, when, when selling in the EU. Uh, the marketplaces are responsible for theirs and you, the seller, are responsible for your own websites. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I've broken it down into a few different cases here just to really simplify it because I know if you're not used to VAT, then I've just probably overwhelmed you with uh, a lot of words. Um, so the first uh, case here, so business A is located in the USA and they sell goods to the UK and EU customers via their own website and they hold stock in ShipBob's UK and Polish fulfillment centers. So what do they need to do? So if this is you, this is what you'll have to register. You need to register for VAT in the UK and in Poland. You'll want an um, EORI number in the UK and one in the EU in order to get your goods into the EU. And you'll also want to register on the Union One Stop Shop scheme in the EU to sell cross border um, to private individuals. Case number two here, so business B is located in Canada. Um, they sell the, to customers across the EU via um, Amazon uh, Pan EU in Europe, and they distribute from Amazon and ShipBob fulfillment. So what do you need to do? So Amazon is actually going to collect all of the sales VAT and report this to the tax authority on your behalf. So that's great news. What you need to do as a seller, you still have to have those local VAT registrations in um, all of the countries where you're holding your inventory. So that could be six or seven different countries if you're using the Amazon Pan EU Fulfillment Center along with ShipBob's um, Fulfillment Center, for example. And you'll need your EU EORI number as well. And finally, in business case C here, um, this business is located in the USA and they're selling direct to the UK and the EU um, customers via their own website and through Amazon. And they hold all of their stock in the UK. So what do they need to do? So they need to get registered in the UK. Amazon is going to collect and remit VAT on Amazon sales imported under the IOS scheme into the EU. And Amazon is also going to take on that responsibility of the sales made to UK customers as well. The import one-stop shop scheme is going to be beneficial for this seller when selling on their own website to customers in the EU. Um, and you can't use Amazon's import one-stop shop number for own, your own website sales. So it's really important to make sure um, that you use your own IOS number for your own transactions. And I think I have one final slide here, which is really just a useful checklist for you um, to utilize when you are uh, looking to go into the EU um, and start your cross-border expansion. Um, and there's just maybe two points I want to raise here. Um, so make sure that you're going to be charging VAT based on where your end customers are located. I've talked about this a few times in this presentation, but it's really, really important because you could be, um, you know, uh, uh, impacting your margins because somewhere uh, somebody could have bought some uh, a product from you in Hungary, which is the VAT rate of 27%, and you may have only been accounting for 20% in your margins. So you would have been losing it on the 7% there. So you really need to make sure that your systems can take the, the fluctuations and the prices that you set can take the um, fluctuations and um, VAT rates across the EU. 
And the other thing I, I want to raise in this checklist is make sure um, you review your entry into the EU um, and use the schemes available. So really look at your supply chain, look at where you're um, selling from. Are you using the Polish warehouses? Are you using the UK warehouses? Where are your customers located? And make sure you're registering and optimizing your tax um, so that you can uh, sell internationally from there. Thank you so much. And to answer Lydia's question, um, we will have a recording sent out to you of this webinar. I know it's a lot of information to take on. I get still confused about VAT obligations and a lot of things when it comes to expanding to new, um, new countries around the world. So you will get a copy of this sent. And then at the end, we do have information on how you get in touch with Alex and Lucinda if you want to be consultant and have extra questions on global expansion as well as Jordan. So we'll have everyone's information there as well, just in case you want to connect, because Alex and her team at Simply VAT are our number one partner for getting VAT registered um, and doing the VAT, uh, VAT tax filings after you started shipping in the EU and UK. Um, so you can actually sign up with Simply VAT and have them help manage you, consult you, or manage and consult getting the registration as well as managing the, uh, the VAT tax filings that are monthly or quarterly. Um, so this is a full service that they can do for you. So don't be overwhelmed. I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the uh, by all the topic, the, everything that she talked about as well, but we'll send this to you and then you can get in touch if you have more questions. And then we'll kick it off to Lucinda, who's going to talk about recent changes with Brexit and other changes that are happening in 2022. Thanks, Francesca, and thanks, Alex, for that uh, really, really comprehensive uh, review of, of VAT. It's incredibly complicated, and I know a lot of British companies are getting uh, tripped up by it at the moment. Um, so I'm Lucinda O'Reilly, founder of the International Trade Consultancy, and I set up my business specifically to help uh, companies in the EU, the UK, um, with dealing with the new uh, customs framework that uh, came into effect when uh, the UK left the EU. Um, so apologies if I am going over old ground and you know all this, but it's always worth reminding ourselves of the context before we think about anything relating to how we trade uh, between the UK and the EU, especially as quite a few changes came into force at the beginning of this month. Uh, which I will go into a bit more detail shortly. So when the UK was a member of the European Union, we benefited from frictionless trade, which meant that goods travelled back and forth without the need for customs declarations or import duty in either direction. But from January 1st in 2021, um, trade was, has been conducted between the two territories according to the terms of the UK-EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, which was negotiated and not actually signed until the 31st of December 2020. So it really went down to the wire. Um, and so businesses really didn't have very much time to prepare. You know, uncertainty is the worst possible thing for a business. So we, we could prepare for one scenario, we could prepare for another scenario, but we didn't actually know right until the last minute exactly what we were dealing with. Um, and you may have heard the uh, trade agreement described as a zero tariff, zero quota deal, um, which is true up to a point, but there are conditions that need to be met uh, for that to be the case. And that's where the rules of origin come in. So whilst British exporters, I'll just, sorry, I'll talk now about um, the change to import declarations for goods coming into the UK from the EU. Um, whilst British exporters have had to provide complete export declarations throughout 2021 for goods that they send to the EU, the British government introduced an easement for all EU traders sending goods to the UK because of concerns around delays to food and medicines. And obviously that was um, exacerbated by the supply chain disruption uh, caused by the pandemic. Um, and then we had the Suez crisis. So, you know, it really was a, a perfect storm in terms of problems with supply chains. So the government introduced this easement um, and it meant that EU traders 
um, when they were sending goods to the, the UK, they had to complete a basic export and import declaration uh, when the goods left the EU. But then when the goods arrived in the UK, they had 175 days to uh, supply the rest of the information uh, to, to finish off the, the customs declaration. So they had a lot of leeway there. Um, but from the 1st of January this year, EU traders have also had to do the complete declaration up front. Um, and for the first couple of weeks of the year, it didn't seem to be too much of a problem. But you may have seen um, stories in the press recently. There were long uh, queues at Calais and long queues at Dover, um, because the third week of January is always the week when uh, trade ramps up again, uh, deliveries ramp up because stocks have started to run low and, and people are looking at, at new products. So that has uh, started to become an issue. And it does seem that a lot of EU traders were actually caught out and weren't prepared for this. So um, as Alex mentioned, there's there's a lot of paperwork that, that has to be uh, done, a lot of information that has to be uh, completed for these, these declarations. So you've got the export declaration, when the goods leave the EU, the import declaration when it comes into the UK. Um, you need your EORI number. Uh, you need to think about things like INCO terms because that affects who pays uh, the tax if there is any. Um, so a lot of information has to be supplied up front. Um, and just as a, a note for general knowledge, um, in addition to the full import declarations, Suppliers and customers should also be aware that physical inspections may now be uh, carried out at the ports and uh, duties will be payable at points of import as well. So to try and smooth out this new process, um, port operators can adopt either or both of two new models that have been developed uh, to try and make things easier by HMRC. Um, the first of these is the temporary storage model. So that's where businesses provide the information required before their goods board the ferry or set off towards the UK. And the customs formalities um, are all done while the goods are temporarily stored uh, in a warehouse at the port after they arrive in Great Britain. Um, the second model is called the pre-lodgement model. Um, and that is where importers complete all the declarations before the goods leave the EU and customs clearance takes place while the goods are in transit. So all those queues um, at the port suggest to me that a lot of people have chosen the pre-lodgement model, um, but weren't really quite prepared to uh, supply all of the information that was required. Um, this model enables companies to move goods quickly and so it's suitable for perishable or high priority items like food and medicines. Um, and if the pre-lodgement model is required for your goods, then the haulier needs to be registered with the goods vehicle movement service. And GVMS enables hauliers, carriers and port operators to use a single goods movement reference number, a GMR, um, for a vehicle or trailer to process it on arrival and departure at the, the port. And GVMS links the movement reference numbers of all the individual um, consignments that are on that particular truck um, with reference to the, the license plate. So the haulier has to have um, a GMR to board any ferry heading to Great Britain from the EU. And you can see that, you know, in, in groupage situations, it just takes uh, one of those consignments to, to have a problem and the whole thing um, gets held up. So it's very important if you are going to be shipping goods um, from the EU to the UK, you need to uh, really think carefully about which model you're going to use, make sure you're prepared, make sure your transport company is prepared um, and just really understand the system in, in detail so you know what's required from you. Next slide, please, Francesca. Okay, so... Um, this change on proof of rules of origin. Um, rules of origin are required um, to, 
they determine uh, whether import duty is payable when you send goods uh, between the, the UK and the EU. Um, and this, this is um, another easement that's come into place at the beginning of the year. So um, up until the end of last year, nobody was checking um, because there was just too much going on. And so it was sufficient to put a declaration on your commercial invoice saying that your goods did comply with the rules of origin, which meant that when they got to um, whichever country you were sending them to in the EU or vice versa, coming back to the UK, uh, import duty wasn't payable. Now, however, customs agents on both sides of the channel are going to be checking. So it's really important that if you uh, claim that your goods comply with rules of origin, you can actually prove that um, that's the case. So if um, you were a manufacturer, um, that could be the bill of materials, um, or it could be a long-term declaration from your supplier if you buy the goods you export from somewhere else. Um, so the burden of, of proof um, goes up the supply chain, but it, it is going to have to be uh, evidenced now, whereas before we could just uh, put this, this uh, declaration on the, the commercial invoice, which is a legal document, and uh, that's really going to be in force now. Um, and just uh, a point for uh, the audience who might be importing goods um, into the EU or the UK uh, from the US or Canada or wherever, and then wanting to send them uh, between the, the UK and the EU, because there isn't um, a trade agreement between the UK and the US or the EU and the US, um, the preferential rules of origin do not apply. So if you import your goods into the Polish uh, Shipboard Fulfillment Center, for example, um, but then it turns out that you need those goods um, at the UK Fulfillment Center to, to meet orders there, you will have to pay import duty again uh, because they will not fall under the uh, preferential rules agreed between the, the EU and the UK in the Trading Cooperation Agreement. So just to reiterate what Alex said, really, it's very, very important to make sure that you've got your inventory in the correct customs territory so that you don't get caught out and end up paying um, import duty twice in addition to uh, the extra transport costs and the cost of doing customs declarations as well. Uh, last slide, please, Fran. So to summarise, just make sure you understand the best import route for your goods uh, from the EU to the UK. If you do end up sending them that way, it's it's really important to, to understand that. But uh, best practice would be to just make sure that you, you've got your inventory in the correct customs territory uh, and, and close to your customers. And that is something that Shipbob can obviously help you with. So thank you. Hey, thanks everyone. That was a more in-depth uh, uh, overview of the changes in VAT obligations than maybe a lot of you uh, wanted to learn. That's why Lucinda and Alex, well, it, it is a lot to take in. Um, so don't be worried, like Lydia said, don't be worried that you couldn't take it all in now because really our merchants, they're not experts in this. That's why they come to Lucinda and Alex to get consultation and use Alex's team simply that to continuously um, file VAT, their VAT taxes quarterly or monthly and just um, keep on with that besides rather than them actually doing it themselves. So like, don't be don't be overwhelmed. Everyone's overwhelmed when they're experiencing the EU and UK, but that's why we have this webinar in place and have these partnerships in place. Um, so I'll leave this on the screen so you guys can take it down. So if you're interested in talking about global expansion on the fulfillment side of things, um, reach out to Jordan. Um, he is who spoke first. He's our ship Bob rep. He'll get you connected with his team um, to talk about uh, global expansion opportunities uh, for simply VAT to understand your VAT obligations and um, what the process is to get VAT registered. Um, reach out to the email here. Um, it's a shipbob at simplyvat.com. They're giving you a promotion of 50 pounds off registration and 50% off your first month's filings, um, as well as getting in contact with Lucinda for consulting purposes. 
um, reach out to the email here, uh, quote ship Bob 22 for a free 15 minute consultation. Um, so I'll leave this up here and I'll check the questions. Um, and if you guys have any questions too, feel free to put them in the Q and A session, Q and A section so we can go over them and have the team uh, answer them right now. But I think the first question would be for Alex or whoever wants to take this over. I get asked this a lot. Uh, how long does it take to get that registered and get that all set up to be live, to be legally able to ship product in the EU and UK? Because I think that's the biggest thing is people have their inventory coming, but it's not timed right, or maybe it took a little bit longer than expected. And so they actually can't ship product or even import it until they have the setup, correct? Yeah, yeah, correct. And, and you want to make sure that you have your VAT registration in place so that you can reclaim the import VAT as well. So that's just not lost money in the void. Um, you as a business really want to be able to reclaim the, any import taxes. Um, so it's important to have your VAT registration in place. Um, but it's a, it's a good question to ask and we get asked it quite a lot. Um, how long does a VAT registration take? So this depends on the individual tax authorities processing. It can take anywhere between four weeks all the way up to maybe 12 weeks in somewhere like France, for example, it does take some time. Um, but that is just the processing time. So it's important that you or who is ever in charge of getting the VAT registration really focuses on it for a short period of time to fill in the documentation. Um, we have a really simple process at Simply VAT uh, where you use our portal called Simply Share. And this will walk you through the steps of how to get a VAT registration and all the forms you need to fill out. It's really just about two forms. So. Um, I would suggest making sure that one person really focuses for uh, a short period of time. It's like ripping off a Band-Aid, a little bit of work at the beginning, and then all the documents get sent off to the tax authorities. And once they're sent off, it's kind of a waiting game from there, um, waiting for the tax authorities. And that's where it can take that four to 12 weeks, depending on the country you're getting registered in. Um, so make sure that you are really prepared to take that, that time to just get those VAT registration documents completed. And then um, the rest, uh, once once we're waiting for the registration to process, that's where you can start setting up your shipments, um, getting ready to go with ShipBob and um, and sorting out all of the customs uh, documentation and everything um, from there. So definitely a first point of call. Okay. Um, and then you guys do the VAT tax filing for your customers as well to align with the different schemes, correct? So from there, after the registration, you're still, um, for lack of a better term, like hand holding them through the process to get it done. Absolutely. So I think that's a really important thing is once you're VAT registered, you still have to make these filings now to the tax authority. Um, each tax authority across the UK and EU, um, they're all different. They don't have one specific, um, you know, process to, to fill in a VAT return. Um, some require quarterly filings, some re require monthly filings, for example. Um, so it is important to, to use someone um, such as ourselves to help you get VAT registered and help with the ongoing compliance. Um, for us, we have um, APIs available so that we can pull transactional data on your behalf and then calculate the VAT returns. Um, and then all you will have to do on a monthly basis is actually just pay the VAT. So we try to make it as simple as possible for you. Awesome. I didn't even know it worked that easily because at ShipBob, that's what we're all about, automating the process. We have integrations built out, built out. So that's great that they can have that same kind of process of it's automated. They don't really have to think about it. If they have questions, then they check in with you. Yeah, I think I made it sound quite complex to actually, I really like to explain the rules so that people know what they're getting into, especially when they come over. I think it's good to understand um, the market, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to handle it day in and day out and know every single rule. And I think that's what's really beneficial about having service providers help um, with those sorts of um, things. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, a question from Bob, who's one of our merchants that's located in Reno Valley, he shared, how are or how are VAT exempt products dealt with in the EU countries, for example, some foods? Yeah, so this is a good question. So um, it will depend on your food product. Um, each and like I mentioned, um, each v, uh, each EU member state is quite different. Um, 
they don't have a, a consistent VAT regime, whether or not um, food specific food categories are VAT uh, rated at standard rate, reduced rate, have an exempt rate, or even um, further reduced rate. So it will really depend on the EU member state that you're dealing with, as well as the type of food product um, that you are selling. Some um, products within the EU and UK um, will say a cookie, for example, if it's uh, an oat cookie, it could be charged at a um, reduced rate because it could be considered healthy, whereas a cookie covered with a layer of chocolate might um, fall under a, um, a standard rate because, uh, you know, it, it has that layer of extra layer of chocolate on it. And that's how detailed the VAT um, uh, laws go um, and depends really on, on the item that you're selling. So if you have questions about specific products and the VAT rates that you, you are um you should be charging on them, then definitely get in touch and we can help um, sort that for you and, and help you understand what that rate you should be charging. Another question we have from Kevin, can you reclaim import VAT on goods imported into the EU with U Union OSS? That's a really, really good question. Um, you cannot. So that's why when I mentioned in my presentation, um, you'll have your union OS registration and your local OS registration. Um, so say you're using uh, ShipOps Warehouse in Poland. We'll use this as a really good example. You'll have a Polish local VAT return and the union OS return. The local VAT return is going to be used to declare any um, domestic sales to domestic customers. So say you make a, a sale to a Polish uh, customer, that will be on the Polish return. If you make any B2B transactions throughout the EU, that will also be recorded on the Polish return. Any import VAT reclaims or purchase VAT reclaims, that's also going on that local VAT return. The Union OS only covers cross-border B2C sales. So only if it's uh, the goods are leaving Poland to go to another EU member state and that the customer is a private individual. So they don't have a VAT registration ID that they've supplied you um, to have what's called the reverse charge mechanism. Um, so the union also is a very specific um, ID and return for a specific type of sale uh, to private individuals, mainly targeted at e-commerce sellers. Good question. Anyone else that's attending, feel free to pop some questions in, um, ask anything that you would like. I think we have some pre-seed questions for Lucinda. Um, what's the situation if an importer is misled by their supplier about whether they can claim preference? Who is liable for the duty? Lucinda, you're on mute as well. Sorry. Yeah, it's, a, it's an unfortunate one because it's the importer's responsibility to check so if you didn't pay import duty because your supplier told you the goods qualified for preferential treatment when they didn't and HMRC uh, follow up and want to see the evidence, as I was talking about before, that's just kicked in, um, you will have to pay the duty retrospectively plus interest and also possibly a fine. So it's really um, on you to, to make sure that you, you do check carefully the commodity code and the free trade agreement to, to make sure that any goods that you're importing do in fact qualify for zero import duty. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any questions they want to throw in? Because I'll just keep asking questions if no one has any other questions. Oh, here we go. Thanks, Bob. Do you need to have both union and non-union OS schemes if customer orders or if a customer orders multiple items that take the order value above the 150 pound limit? Mm -hmm. Good question. So um, the non-union OS scheme is only for services or digital downloads. So if you are not selling that, then disregard the non-union OS scheme from your from your brain and your memory. Um, you don't need to worry about the non-union OS scheme. Um, for physical goods, it's going to be the union OS scheme. Now, when we talk about that 150 euro limit, that 150 euro limit 
only applies to imported goods. So that is imported under the import one-stop shop scheme. And that's from outside the EU going to a customer inside the EU. The union off scheme does not have any thresholds. So you can be selling cross-border um, to a private individual up to any value and that all get recorded under the union off scheme. It is only the import one-stop shop scheme that has the 150 euro limit. So hopefully that um, helps you out. I see you say we there, um, Bob. So yeah, you don't need to worry about um, having multiple registrations. Like I said, if you're using someone like ShipBob in Poland, you'll just need the Polish VAT registration and the Union OS registration in Poland. Those are the only two you'll need to worry about um, in that case. So you don't need to worry about any of the other ones I mentioned. And Gina asks, does that include gift cards? Um, so gift cards are, uh, oh, for the non-Union OS scheme. Um, that's a really good question. I would have to go back and double check about gift cards because gift cards would be slightly different because um, it would depend what you're actually selling on uh, with that gift card. Um, so I, I can double check. And if you do have that um, question, I can send that back to you or I can get Gina to distribute that um, or Francesca to distribute that to the listeners. It's Alex. Okay, I'm running out of questions. Um, <laughs> so if the attendees have any other questions, feel free to pop them in and we'll just wait a minute. I have a question for Jordan. Oh, you have a question for Jordan? Great. Yeah, my question is, um, you know, it's quite exciting that um, ShipBob is moving into Poland and I kind of want to know why Poland and I'm sure some people are saying, why Poland? Um, why why does ShipBob want to go to Poland? So I think that's a really good good one. Yeah, no, that's a really good question and it does come up quite a bit. So thank you for asking it. Um, so Poland, there's a lot of good reasons for being it. It's a pretty, from a warehouse standpoint and having a facility, and, uh, having that square footage, Poland had a lot more available than Germany is. Um, as Alex mentioned in her presentation here earlier, German's the biggest market in the EU. So there's not a lot of warehouse footage and square footage to take up for us there in Germany, but Poland's the next best option. Our facility's right over the German border We'll have a direct feed into Germany each day from Poland to get a faster time in transit. So really having Poland was for two reasons, more economical from a square footage standpoint and then also from a labor standpoint. Um, but it still services Germany tremendously. And so that's why I went with Poland um, instead of being in Germany. And what's the location of your fulfillment center in the UK, Jordan? Uh, so the one in the UK is right outside of Manchester. Great. How exciting. A great opportunity. Yeah, we're really excited and we're going to keep expanding um, and adding more facilities, especially if they fill up too, which is what happened um, in London. We had an, added another facility, but um, we'll be adding more facilities in the region um, just so we can support more merchants, but then adding hopefully more in the EU, fingers crossed, in the near future. We won't make any promises, um, but we're at time, we're coming at time and there's um, no more questions. So if you have any specific questions or want to connect with these three, screenshot this, reach out to them um, and claim your discounts for either a free consultation or if you're going to go and actually um, want to expand to the EU with the VAT registration, which is a super awesome deal um, that they're running for uh, this webinar only. Um, yeah. And uh, feel free to reach out, with us, uh, out to us. Um, and that's all we got for you guys. So everyone have a great morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are. Um, and we'll see you next time for the cross-border series.